So hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'll just go back one slide here. So today we're going to be um, looking at preparation for transition from the Australian National Descriptors for Texture Modified Food and Thickened Liquids to EDSI, um, but as specific to our Australian disability stakeholders. Um, so first of all, just a very quick thank you and acknowledgement to the IDSI supporters and sponsors. We have um, international sponsors um, who provide us with funds so that we can keep the website up to date and provide resources. And then also an acknowledgement to our Australian Steering Committee. And you can see the, uh, the various groups that are on our Australian Steering Committee there. I'm going to uh, run through just a, a little bit of background for people who've not, um, who aren't familiar with IDSI and then we'll, we'll get sort of more specifically into the changes. So very briefly, um, IDSI was um, published online in November 2015 at the IDSI website uh, and the framework and the development of the framework was published in the Dysphagia Journal in 2017. Um, that publication is freely available. Um, through there. I'm going to pop out of um, screen mode for a minute here. Um, so, sorry for that. Um, so it's, the IDSI framework is a global standardised framework. It provides us with terminology and definitions for both texture modified foods and thickened liquids. Uh, a lot of previous ones had focused on one or the other um, or they were only for um, adults and, and not specifically for children, whereas this one um, is for people of all ages in all, all cultures and all care settings. So we're looking at a continuum of eight levels from zero through to seven. It is a colour coded model and those colour codes have been designed specifically so that they're suitable for people with red green colour blindness. We've used culturally neutral terminology as well to ensure that the terms can be um, translated and we've also used just a standard numbering system because that again from our um, stakeholder support and our research um, advice was what people around the globe would um, most easily recognise. So the framework has descriptors, testing methods and evidence for drink thickness and food texture levels. We recommend for safety that people use at least two out of the three ways of describing. So that could be the number, the colour or the label. But at least two out of three is what's important there for safety. So the, the entire system for EDSI is driven by safety. So we're looking at safety through common terminology for people of all ages in all care settings and in all cultures. I wanted to share with you just a, um, some recent information as well. So um, in June of this year, we had information come through that was published on the BBC News where they talked about patients who choked on hospital soft food. So people who had died because there were problems with the way the food was being described and people with chewing or swallowing problems. So the, the NHS wants all that NHS staff to clearly categorise food textures as published by the International Dysphagia Diet Standardisation Initiative. So it, it's great to see some independent bodies who are um, providing um, feedback that recognises um, what IDSI is doing and this is the uh, the patient safety alert that was then um, released and endorsed by the British Dietetic Association and the Royal College of Speech Language Therapists. Here in Australia we have um, information from uh, Professor Joseph Ibrahim so Professor Ibrahim um, reports out of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine and he was looking specifically at um, preventing um, preventable deaths, particularly in aged care. And so choking is the second highest cause of preventable death in aged care. So that's from here in Australia. Out of the recommendations document that Professor Ibrahim published, you'll see that there are, um, so that recommendation 20 at the, at the beginning um, was that a suitably qualified Australian National Steering Committee develop guidelines um, for people in aged care facilities um, that align with the International Dysphagia Diet Standardisation Initiative. So this again was an independent recommendation. And then if you're looking for some further um, information, there are some um, specific recommendations in there to um, help safeguard against um, choking as well. 
And whilst they are specific, um, he has specifically looked at aged care, um, they are in fact appropriate to use beyond that. So for example, so with um, care homes, for example, and I've got some further information on that too. Just a, um, some information that's often not understood, choking deaths increase by age and although we're really familiar with children age one to four having really high choking risks and you know we see a lot of toys and even food items um, where we recognise that things like peanuts and those sorts of things are a real problem for children with choking risk. When you have a look at the, um, at the graph you can see that it increases also for people um, who are older as well. So people older than 65 years of age um, have seven times higher the choking risk than children aged one to four years. This is some very new information um, from the New South Wales Ombudsman's Report. Sorry, I'm just moving that around. I'm sorry for the distraction there. So the, the New South Wales Ombudsman has been looking at um, the deaths of people with disability and residential care. And they've been doing this for about, they've been reporting on it for nine years now. So this is the most recent one that was published um, on the 31st of August, 2018. Now in that document, um, they show that choking was a factor in the deaths of 11 people over that um, four year period and most of them had known risks for, fa uh, for choking and what's important here I think are the inclusions that they show, so swallowing difficulties, missing teeth, eating and drinking behaviours such as eating too quickly, overfilling their mouth, swallowing um, without adequately chewing and then these were the probably the key strategies that they thought were important there to try and mitigate some of those risks. So for staff to consider consistently follow the person's eating and drinking requirements, making sure that there's effective supervision. And that was critical actually when you look um, at a number of these cases, that things like restrictive practices such as locked fridges are not fail safe and they don't replace effective um, supervision. And that there needs to be really good communication between the providers about significant choking risks and management strategies. And also a way of monitoring not just sentinel events, but also close calls. Quite often when they went back and looked at those deaths, um, the people who had died had had two, or three or even four really close calls so there needed to be systems in place and they found that quite often staff would fill out the forms but didn't recognise that they needed to be doing something about it and that writing in the progress notes wasn't actually the best thing for them to do that nothing sort of happened as a result of that so filling in an incident report form um, but more importantly also knowing what to do in an emergency was really critical. Um, just a little bit more information that came out of that report, so looking at people with disability in residential care, you can see that pneumonitis due to solids and liquids, so this is where they've aspirated and um, either food or liquid and it's caused a pneumonia. Um, and you can see between 2014, 15 and up to 2016, 17 that pneumonitis due to solids and liquids had increased to become the top thing there. For people looked after by, um, just in general, by disability services for the whole period 2003 to 2017, that pneumonitis due to solids and liquids was probably the highest, um, was the, the top to, in the top 10, um, number one as the top leading cause of death there. And then further down, so that's where a pneumonia develops and this is the obstruction, so an acute choking event. So both of those things are really critical for us to be um, familiar with, which is why we're looking at um, foods and drinks. So why are we changing here in Australia? We've got our um, Australian standardised texture modified foods and liquids. They were published in 2007 and so they're now more than 10 years old. While they were best in class in 2007, we've had some further um, development by way of evidence. And so the new ITSI standards took the Australian standards, other published national standards and built on them. So one of the things that Australia did very well uh, back in 2012, we evaluated the uptake of the Australian standards. And through that, we had some uh, feedback from clinicians, paediatric clinicians in particular, that there was a thickness level that they used that wasn't adequately represented by our Australian standards. And that's what ITSI refers to as um, slightly thick. So something that is a thick liquid, but not as thick as mildly thick because we need it to go through um, an infant teat. The other thing is that the Australian standards are predominantly based on uh, descriptions. 
Um, and so with IDSI, we have some objective measurements that help to increase safety and minimise that subjective characterisation. So here's some more information about those objective um, measures. So what we're aiming to do, when I say, you know, this is thick or it's soft or it's small, and you say it's thick or soft or small, we know that we're both talking about the same thing. So we're minimising the need for personal subjective judgement. We've chosen those tests to be simple, quick, portable and reliable and that was on the basis of advice from a nurse from the National Patient Safety Agency who had, to, it's part of her role to attend coronial inquests and she said that people needed um, a way of being able to assess where they could do it at the bedside or out in a cafe. Um, not that you need to do it every time but that just that it's possible to do that. Um, and so those tests are most useful for initial staff training, for auditing, for industry to, um, to develop and test their products and also for kitchen use to develop and test um, recipes. I think they are also quite critical for people who look after um, and carers of people with disability, particularly if they go out into the community where they are um, using items from restaurants or cafeterias and they want to be able to check whether it's right or, or quickly move away things that aren't safe. These, you know, you, you'll need a fork or a spoon or a, a 10 mil syringe to be able to check. So all of the testing can be done in 10 seconds or less is the other selling point, if you like. Um, in terms of our mapping um, in Australia from for foods, let's start with those. So our Australian standards, we've got regular texture A, soft texture B, minced and moist texture C, smooth puree. With IDSI, we retain most of those labels. So regular, soft and bite-sized, minced and moist, pureed, and we have this new texture level liquidised that we knew was being um, quite often used in palliative care, for example. Um, so we lose the ABC and replace them with numbers. Uh, we also have colours that come up through the, uh, the food system as well. Uh, and we have a new texture description, which is transitional foods, and I'll talk more about that soon. So this slide is also available just so that you know on the EDSI website or you can, if you email me at this email address, I can also send it to you. So let's have a, a quick look at what changes then. So with Texture A Soft and looking at the Australian guidelines there, um, we've got the descriptive characteristics, but there was actually also testing um, information there. <clears throat> So the target particle size for infants and children was less than half of that for adults and children over five years of age. So it was to be eight millimetres or 0.8 centimetres based on tracheal size. And for children over five years of age and adults, it was 1.5 by 1.5 centimetres. So there's no uh, change to particle size measurement there. What ITSI has done though is added fork pressure tests to make sure the softness side of it is also um, addressed. I wanted to also just draw your attention to some of the other information that was published about Texture A Soft. And whilst you'll see things like soft sandwiches and pasta and those sorts of things included, there was actually a diacritic, a little A at the top there, that meant that they needed to be looked at on a case by case basis. So soft sandwiches were never, ever part of a standard soft diet for people with swallowing difficulties. So just to make, make sure that people were aware of that, I am aware, particularly with the hospital webinars, um, that that was something that had been assumed. Um, and just also to let you know that in um, Western Australia, for example, most recently, the Western Australian government has taken soft sandwiches off the standard soft menu there because of two sentinel events and something similar has happened in South Australia. So we need that consistent terminology for safety. So this, this comes from the New South Wales Ombudsman's report that was published in 2015. And here they talk about the death of a boarding house resident from choking on a sandwich after being discharged on a hospital soft diet. So there wasn't adequate information about what that actually meant. And in the 2018 report, we notice um, that, they, that the New South Wales Ombudsman also identifies transfers as a particularly high risk situation for people with chewing and swallowing problems. So where people are assessed in hospital, they might have gone into hospital for an acute need and they're on their way back to a, um, 
their um, care home, for example, or back into the community, uh, that there have been uh, critical incidents or near misses that have occurred in that transfer process or while the person was awaiting transfer. Um, so why do we adjust particle size? Now I'm just showing you some of these videos in order that um, to, to share them with you. So ITSI's been um, given permission to use these videos um, with video credits thanks to the developers of the Dynamic Swallow and we're going to be developing these into some small packages that you'll be able to use for education purposes that will be available from the ITSI website. So this video fluoroscopy shows normal chewing. So as you can see we're looking at a lateral view we can see that the bolus is chewed very effectively and pushed down, there's a, a second clearing swallow. And then if we look here, um, this first one to demonstrate, this time someone just chewing with a chewing impairment, so they're chewing all at the front of their mouth. You can also see some of the material starting to enter the pharynx and move all the way down into the piriform sinus, just to help people understand that with this airway being open, that that's a potential choking risk. And then this um, video, which shows the person with really limited or no chewing skill and just tipping their head back to push that um, solid piece down, that ends up in the trachea. So hopefully um, just some small two, three minute videos that include that information as well as, um, for example, the, the minced and moist or the soft and bite sized information might help you with your um, carer's education or, or even education to um, the person with, um, with disability. So if we look at our soft and bite sized to start with, as I mentioned, these are 1.5 by 1.5 centimetres for adults and that's about the size of an adult thumbnail. For children it's 8 millimetres by 8 millimetres. We've got the descriptive information there but you need to know that it's more than just the description. So yes, you should be able to easily cut it with just the size of a fork but to check that it's soft enough you need to be able to press down into a bite sized piece of food with your thumb in the bowl of the fork hard enough so that the thumbnail turns to white. So that pressure is about 17 kilopascals and we know that there's a relationship between that and the pressure that's applied during swallowing. Now that food should squash and completely break apart. You shouldn't just be leaving indentation marks in the food. So both of those elements are critical, both the size and the softness. Um, one of the questions we're asked, why aren't those sandwiches on the level six often bite-sized diet? And that's because not all bread types are equal. So if you think about when I say the word bread, and we've got a hospital in the US recently that's gone through this process where they use their diet system to go through and track every mention of bread. And they actually included bread pudding there as well. And then brought all of those items up and looked at them and recognised that they were completely different. So your white bread, your brown bread, your multigrain, your, your you know, very very crusty baguette, your bread roll, brioche bread, gluten-free bread is particularly dry. Um, so we've got different moisture content in those different types of bread. The, the size of the breadcrumbs are also quite different as well. And they've also got fibres that you actually need to break them down. You can't fork mash bread. If ever you're needing to help a carer understand that bread is quite a complicated thing, um, show them that you can't fork mash bread. And that's before we put some filling between those two pieces of bread. We also have a lot of autopsy data, so people have died from choking on a whole range of things. Um, these are the published autopsy things and you'll notice that bread or sandwiches or toast come up in every single one of them, including these ones and including from you know, different parts of the world, including Japan. So it's not to be taken lightly. The next question I'm asked is, what if our patients are actually already eating bread and sandwiches? And my answer is, look, if they've already been assessed as safe by a speech pathologist who's watched them have bread or have sandwiches, then there's no reason they can't continue to be included. So, and, and just that reminder, they should never have been included as standard on that regular soft. They should always have been included after assessment by a speech pathologist. And if as a speech pathologist you've decided that they are safe for bread and sandwiches, then maybe look at trying some other foods to see whether maybe it's possible to liberalise some of their other um, diets as well. Uh, you know, the other textures I'm, I guess I'm talking about. 
Um, so the next thing is, what if our patients don't need their food cut up, but they do need it to be soft and tender? So it's the international, heard that very strongly from the international community, that we need a level of food that's soft and tender, but not cut up. Um, and so we had some um, fairly robust international consultation. That level is now called level seven, regular, easy to chew, or just level seven, easy to chew. So our regular diet um, has no particle size restrictions and it, and it includes all textures. So if you look at this picture down here, for example, if we were to add um, mashed potato here, you'd see that there are in fact a range of textures that are usually standard on any given plate, any, any regular dinner plate. So we've got our lamb chops there and you obviously need good chewing skills for those. But the carrots have been cut up. The broccoli is in florets so that you might choose to cut that further before you chew it and bite it. But the mashed potato wouldn't need any chewing. You just pop that in your mouth and swallow it down. So it includes all textures. We decided to put this level seven um, easy to chew into this area because we feel that this is where it belongs, that there shouldn't be any increased risk of choking at this level and no mealtime behaviours that increase risk. So we have said it, so it's basically soft food without the particle size restriction. But given that we know that a lot of people have died on soft food, we felt that there is a differentiation between people who are who might choose to eat this level of softness um, or have the capacity to break it down themselves and also the insight and the self-regulation to be able to manage this level. So you should be able to easily cut it or flake it with the light pressure from the side of a fork. So this allows you to have omelettes and pancakes and those sorts of things. We don't believe this texture is appropriate if there are any concerns about choking risk that's related to chewing ability. And so we don't think it's appropriate if there are mealtime behaviours that make eating unsafe because we know that people can choke on this. Um, the particle size, when you look at all of the systematic reviews, is the thing that helps to protect against that. So that's why there is that differentiation. And we've got some examples of the unsafe mealtime behaviours from the New South Wales Ombudsman. So things like not chewing much, putting too much food in the mouth, eating too fast or swallowing large mouthfuls of food. Um, very soon, hopefully, maybe even by the end of the week, um, we will have um, patient handouts um, that, are, that will be available to you, not just for level seven, but in fact, for all of the EASY levels. These have been road tested in, um, well, the other levels have been road tested in New Zealand this year and have been put through a consumer review for readability also. So we look forward to sharing that with you. In terms of when we change from the paediatric to the adult particle sizes, again, this information comes from autopsy data. Um, you will notice that there was a change from the Australian standards where we'd mentioned five years of age, um, and we've moved this time more conservatively, I guess, to puberty. But we've also said that it could be on doctor's recommendation. If doctor is happy that the person has grown sufficiently, that their trachea would be able to manage a piece of food if it accidentally went down the wrong way that is 1.5 by 1.5 centimetres, then that's fine. Um, so that, that's built in there. We recognise that, so th it is in fact to do with um, size and uh, more than anything else. So they need to be physically big enough. And the best way I can describe this is a little bit like the way we change the car seat orientation when children are the correct weight as opposed to chronological age. So if we look at our minced and moist from Australia, what changes here? And the recommended particle size for infants had a range on it. So two mils to five mils and for um, people over five years and adults, it was five millimetres. So for adults in with EDC, we have a four millimetre lump size and we were quizzed and queried to say, well, what is a lump size? Um, so we said, okay, it's four mil by four mil by no larger than 15 millimetres. And I'll explain more about that on the next slide. And for paediatrics, it's a two millimetre lump size or two mil by two mil by no larger than eight. And again, children can move to the adult lump size at the doctor's discretion. Sorry after this one. Okay, so again, um, it should be soft and moist with no separate thin liquid. So when you scoop it up with the fork, you haven't got any liquid drizzling through it. It needs to be soft enough that you could mash those lumps just with your tongue. Um, and no, yeah, so nothing falling off the fork. So it shouldn't be dry and crumbly, for example. 
That four millimetre size was chosen um, because it, it meant that we had some very um, easy testing methods, but there was also some information from the literature to support it. So the gap, the standard gap between a standard dinner fork prongs, these gaps here, is four millimetres. And we tested that, we looked at that around the world, in fact. The other beauty of this is that if you happen to have food in front of you, if you're at a cafeteria or a restaurant, and it's not the correct size, you can use that fork to mash it down so until it is the correct size. So for minced and moist, we have three critical elements. We have particle size. It needs to be soft enough to squash easily with the fork or a spoon but you don't need your thumbnail to blanch to white and it needs to be moist so not too sticky and not too runny and it should be able to, to pass the spoon tilt test where it will come off easily without sticking to the spoon. These are some examples of what the four millimetre lump size looks like and the two millimetre lump size. Um, IDSI is in the process of providing, um, a, a, we're just in the very final phases of a um, big framework poster that will have these images on them that we'll make available for you. Um, so this is what I wanted to explain about the, you know, how does it become, you know, four mil by four mil. Um, so this is the, um, the adult particle size here. Um, if the framework document states four millimetre lump size, but the, uh, you know, what, what does this look like in clinical practice? So do the lumps, lumps need to be exactly four millimetres by four millimetres? So if the answer to that was yes, it would mean that rice would have to be ground down to meet the particle size requirements. However, rice is less than four millimetres wide in Torbett's directions and it's about eight to 10 millimetres long. Now the beauty of rice is that people recognise it as food. It's not so pulverised down that, that they don't recognise it and they're more likely to reject it. From a clinical perspective, it also offers just a, a little bit of incentive. The sensory receptors are also likely to recognise it as something that needs some light chewing. And so that's, that's the best way to describe it. So it doesn't have to be exactly 15 millimetres it needs to be four mil by four mil in two of its dimensions and no more than 15 mil. And again, the, the rationale for that is that a chewed bolus is not exactly neat either. Um, but it, it, most often particle sizes come down to about four mils. So these are some examples um, just to show particle size. So mince with chili and rice or the spice lamb with the pearl couscous where you can see when you tip it on its side, it will fall. It meets that four millimetre particle size. When you come to serve, they need to be mixed together because otherwise they're too dry. These are some better images to educate about presentation as well if you're looking to, to help people. So this is just using a standard um, a biscuit cutter mould actually. Um, we just layered the um, the broccoli and the carrot and then the, the meat over here to make it look a bit more attractive. Transitional foods. So these are foods that start as one texture or a solid and change to another when you apply moisture. So things like saliva or water or even temperature. So they would include things like um, that what we would have um, perhaps called dissolvable solids or meltable solids for anyone who uses the SOS terminology as well. Um, and I knew, know that in disability, um, transitional foods are, are very often used. So we need minimal chewing. Tongue pressure might be enough to break it down after the food's been moistened. Um, so often used for developmental skills, but also really good if you've got someone on level five, for example, who is looking for something that is um, a little bit more recognisable as a food and they've got the chewing ability to cope with it, it, it's worth assessing them for that quality of life side of things. Um, now, not all potato crisps obviously are going to be appropriate, so um, you do need to check them. And we have got testing methods for these transitional solids as well. Ice and ice cream would also fall on this level too. Our extremely thick and pureed, um, so no lumps, doesn't require chewing, not sticky, holds its shape on the spoon. So when you scoop it up on a fork, you should, should be able to eat it with a fork basically. You'll see a little mound above it and you might get a little tail below it, but it shouldn't be dolloping or flowing continuously through those prongs of a fork. This is an example of the Idzi spoon tilt test and what we're looking for here is to make sure it's not too sticky because again our autopsy data shows us that sticky foods are a real choking risk. Um, our original framework images were of a, a beautiful panna cotta which were very slippery and came off leaving no residue. We know that there are lots of foods that are appropriate um, but will leave a bit of residue on the spoon. 
Um, so this is an example of a Greek yogurt holding its shape quite nicely on the spoon. It's holding its shape as you tilt it off um, and here in the bowl, but you can see that there's a little bit of residue on the spoon. You can, however, see most of the spoon through the residue. If you need to check, if you're still a bit unsure, I would encourage you as a clinician to pop it in, pop the spoonful in your mouth. If you need, if your upper lip drags across the, the spoon to remove it from the spoon, it is too sticky and too firm. Um, this bottom image shows peanut butter and you can see that that's clearly too sticky and too firm. This is an example of the spoon tilt test and again these videos will shortly be made available on the EDSI website so that you can use them for teaching purposes. So that comes off easily with very little residue. Another one that comes off very easily with little residue. This one, however, is too sticky. You can see that quite a, a lot of uh, wrist flicking action is required to remove that. So it's not just what's left here, it's actually the whole thing, watching what happens to that um, that's bolus. If we move across to mapping with liquids, um, from our Australian standards, we move um, from our level 900, 400 and 150 across to just a standard numbering system, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, we have the addition of a new thickness level, which is slightly thick, and that's the one I spoke about earlier on, that's so that our clinicians who um, help people um, so predominantly for infants um, because it will flow through a standard teat um, but thicker than thin liquids. However, we do know that it's also been used in the palliative care population and there is some um, research that was recently conducted um, in Baltimore uh, where they were showing that uh, for adults where they were showing that there's therapeutic effectiveness of slightly thick, um, that it was protective against aspiration compared to thin and even better than mildly thick. So, you know, we look forward to seeing that research coming out. Um, we do have a change in colours and I know that this has been um, a concern particularly for Australia where we see the green that we associate with mildly thick now become associated with extremely thick. Um, I will let you know that the Australian Steering Committee is very much aware of that risk and that we're looking to develop posters specifically around that to help people um, be aware of that and ready for that changeover. So we do have some new colours here um, coming through to IDSI. Now those colours um, have been designed to be sensitive to red-green colour blindness. You can see with our current Australian standards that the, the green and the pinky colour are right next to each other. So again, these videos, I'll just quickly show them to you, um, will also be made into small educational videos so that they can be used for education purposes. In order for them to be used for education purposes, um, all of this information needs to stay with them. They've only been um, used with permission because they're going to be provided free for people. So they can't be incorporated into paid um, things. Okay, our ITSI te uh, flow test. So the ITSI flow test was designed to test the liquids, the way they move when they're swallowed. It's important that you check the syringe length because there is some variation. In Australia, the BD syringe is the one that, um, that works best and I have got information on the codes available there. The, the easiest way to check is to, um, to take a ruler or one of our test cards and you should have it measure 61.5 millimetres from the zero line to the 10 mil line. Once you've, if you've done that, your syringe should have the correct dimensions. So after that, you remove the plunger, put your little finger over the, the base of the syringe, um, fill it, fill the syringe with 10 mils of liquid, release the nozzle and start the timer, stop the timer after 10 seconds and then read what's left. So this is an example of moderately thick, you can see the liquid is flowing slowly through the syringe because it's thick, as you'd expect. So after 10 seconds of flow, here we go. Um, and I, I tend to use just my phone, but you can use a stopwatch as well if you wish. Now, all of these videos are already available on the EDC website and also on the app as well. So for moderately thick, this is probably the only tricky one insofar as if you have exactly 10 mils left, i.e. it doesn't flow, or if you've got one to two drips after 10 seconds, there's a second step. 
So you need to do the IDSI fork drip test. And if it's dripping slowly or in dollops or strands, then yes, you can call it a moderately thick. It's at the top end of moderately thick. But if it mounds above the fork with a little tail below it, then it's an extremely thick. And you might find that there are some products that are neither one nor the other, so you may need to thicken them up or thin them down depending on what you're after. Again, this is a, a video showing um, moderately thick. So you can see that you wouldn't be able to eat that with a fork, but it's obviously quite thick. This one's mildly thick, again, just to demonstrate and show you the, uh, the change in the flow. Now, just as a reminder, it's not just thick liquids that we can test using this. You can also test things like um, salad dressing, liquid medicines, nutritional supplements. So with mildly thick, four to eight mils remaining. If it falls exactly on the eight mil or exactly on the four mil, it tells you that it's neither um, neither a level one or a level two or neither a level two or, an, or a level three. And you need to either thin it up or thin it down or thicken it up so that it falls within the range that you're after. And this is slightly thick. You can see that that runs more quickly. Um, the other just uh, useful piece of information, if you're looking to calibrate your syringe, let's say you've used your syringe a few times um, and you want to make sure that it's clean, that there aren't any little bits of residue that you can't see. If you put water through the syringe, it should completely flow through the syringe within seven seconds. All right, what if you've already used, uh, say you've made up some thick fluid recipes um, that are used in um, care homes, for example. There's no need to change them. Please just use the flow test to categorise them. That's all you need to do there. Um, you do need to be aware that um, fluid thickness changes with temperature. So when it's cold, you'll find that it's a bit thicker. When it's warm, it's a bit thinner. Now, that's actually always happened. It's just that we have a tool now that's sensitive enough to show that change. All right, let's get ready for um, transition in this sector. And I wanted to draw your attention here. So this is, again, in that New South Wales Ombudsman's report that was published in um, August of this year. Now, the New South Wales Ombudsman recognised that real disparity and the problem that there is with looking after people with disability on what the NDIA or the NDIS covers versus what they feel health should cover. So while they feel that the mealtime management plan is prepared by an allied health professional to prevent conditions like aspiration pneumonia, the development of the plan is supported by the health system, but they advised that supports are generally funded by the NDIS to manage dysphagia and mealtime support. So for speech pathologists to educate and train in formal supports, so carers and family members and other support staff on how to implement the mealtime plan recommendations and also to assist support workers to assist with implementing the mealtime plan, including managing behaviours or providing physical assistance. So I would encourage you to you utilize the education and training components of this this is a change that is coming in um, and i'll share with you shortly the organizations that i've contacted as well um, so here the the ndis um, funding to ensure carers and staff are appropriately trained to implement the guidance and to mitigate risks so i'm hoping that that might make things a little bit easier for you um, as far as educating people um, so I, in October this year, I uh, contacted a number of different groups to alert them to ITSI coming to Australia in, in 1st of May 2019. So with National Disability Services, the information there was disseminated via Nicole Jenkins to, and she's the National Learning Development Manager. I've also been in touch with SCOPE, Urala, Disability Services Consultant, the, the Benevolent Society, Agoski, um, Access Brain Injury Services and Navita. If there are other groups that you feel I, I need to be in touch with that aren't on this page though, please let me know. The things that you can do here um, as well, so when you're looking at, okay, there's so much information, where do I go, what will I look for? Go to the EDSI website, there's lots of information available there. Um, so you can find the EDSI framework um, documents there. Um, there are translations for languages other than English. We know that some carers may not speak English or, or um, 
care support workers or enrolled nurses, for example. Um, I'm going to show you some of the resources. We've got frequently asked questions. If you want to sign up for the international newsletters, the e-bytes are there, but you can also access them. And they only come out once a month or when we've got something to say. They are also um, archived in the resources section. Probably the best thing you could do is download the free app. It's available on iOS and also Google Play. Once you've downloaded the app, all of the data is stored on there, so you don't need continued access to Wi-Fi um, or data, and the videos are included there as well. Um, on our resources page, I wanted to let you know, if you've not recently visited it, that we have general resources, but also country-specific resources. And so all of the Australian newsletters, so there is an October one that hasn't been uploaded yet, and those mapping documents that I've included in the slides here are all loaded up there. We have presentations, so these are PowerPoints that you can download and use as you wish. Um, so why IDSI, the IDSI framework descriptors and testing methods, the resources and tools. Um, we've got publications, we've got lots of webinar recordings as well. Um, lots and lots of resources there. My first suggestion though um, would be to review what you currently have. So just, you know, take a standard plate or, or standard, you know, thick liquids, whatever it might be, compare them to the IDSI detailed descriptors and use the testing methods and then work out what needs to change and what doesn't. These are audit forms and they are also available for download under the implementation um, resources section. So I wanted to share with you, this is a hospital example, but they took just a standard dinner tray and they went through to work out what they had on the plate. So they worked out that the diced carrots were a level six, that the roast beef and the cottage cheese was a level five, that there were lots of things, the mashed potato, the gravy, and some of the drinks were a level four, that the blended vegetable soup was a level three and the nectar thick coffee, and that their vegetable juice was in fact a slightly thick, whoops, so they worked out that that diet would have been suitable for anyone who needed slightly thick um, and soft and bite-sized. Whoops, back here. Um, now in our Australian guidelines, we had a list of foods to include and foods to avoid. And I wanted to just, there's a word of caution there. You do need to use the ITSI testing methods to check because banana would have for sure been on the list of foods to include for things like um, puree or minced, for example. I have um, sadly seen bananas that are green served to patients or, or you know, not ripe um, that aren't in fact appropriate. So perhaps consider wording of things like foods that are often appropriate rather than foods to include and remind people to do their testing. So again, very coming very soon, we've got these types of um, patient handouts that are coming, so they'll include the testing methods on them, links to the website and the food textures to avoid because we know they're a choking risk and there's spaces down here for extra clinician notes as well. I mentioned English as a second language um, and so we have completed translations in a range of languages. Um, these ones are available for review and a number that are in, in progress. Um, they might seem like an odd set of uh, translated languages but these are all done um, through the kindness of translators and we are um, eternally grateful for that. Our adoption in Australia, we are currently in the prepare phase. So what we should be looking at are processes and protocols that need to change, product changes, training clinicians, stakeholders and staff, looking at any material that might need to change computer systems, software, etc. Now our labelling changes, um, we should be preparing and educating consumers. Um, you may see some dual labelling, not so much on the actual uh, labels of products, but perhaps on some of the consumer um, education material. From the 1st of May, you should see the introduction of ITSI labelling. You may even see some in April, um, and they'll continue to use it on their marketing material. If you have any concerns at any stage, please do email me at australia at idsi.org. The, um, in terms of risk management with the pre-packaged labels, there is change over time for product labelling is to be expected. And where we've had legislated label changes, so for allergens or country of origin, um, quite often you give two years um, time frame. Now, 
our manufacturers, uh, the people that I've been communicating with since the decision was taken to adopt ITSI in Australia actually started two years ago. So our manufacturers and industry are on board. They'd like you to contact them directly for information on exactly when their product labels will change. I have had um, one company talk about uh, ITSI being a voluntary standard and just to address that comment, um, just a reminder that the 2007 Australian standardised terminology and definitions um, have also always been a voluntary standard. Um, in lieu of um, government endorsement, if you like, we look to our professional bodies um, who, and so they endorsed the guidelines uh, based on evidence-based practice. So the 2007 guidelines were endorsed by DAA and Speech Pathology Australia. Uh, the endorsement for IDSI came in 2016 by DAA, Speech Pathology Australia and the Institute of Hospitality in Healthcare. Why did they do that? Because IDSI was developed using best practice guideline development processes of the sort that these organisations down here require of their standards and guidelines. I'm not going to go through each of these in detail. If you'd like to read more about it, the, um, the IDSI, um, the development of the IDSI framework in the Dysphagia Journal goes through each of these um, stages of development. Ways we can mitigate risk. Um, so if you've got products where you're trying to help educate people, we have got sticker JPEGs that are available from the EDSI website. So they are literally the JPEGs. You can print them onto sticky labels and then pull them off and stick them onto things. You can also download labels and triangles as well. The EDSI YouTube channel is a huge um, has lots of resources on it. There was a fantastic webinar um, a couple of weeks ago that was provided by Preston Walker and James Ball, who were both UK chefs. Um, Preston, I know, is a Michelin star trained chef, and he talks about some of the myths and truths about modifying um, food. All of these webinars that I'm doing at the moment, so the specific stakeholder ones and the ones that were done with the Institute of Hospitality, um, Healthcare and Catering are also, or will soon be housed on the um, the ITSI YouTube channel. Um, we also have flow test cards and food test cards. So these are, um, again, JPEGs um, or templates, PDF templates that you could take to a, a printing house um, and get them printed out as double-sided um, business cards. We've had them printed out like this um, on business cards. We've made them uh, so that they are a shiny surface so that you can wipe them over. The beauty of this is that you can use them as a ruler because they are done to scale. Um, as I mentioned, ITSI on the go, use the free app. Um, I'd encourage you to download that. We update it constantly so you can see the frameworks there, the, the drink levels, the flow test, um, the videos, all of those sorts of things. ITSI minced and moist sandwich, that's one of the videos up there as well. So my ask is, what we're all trying to do, I think, is to help them all eat and drink safely. We want to stay away, sadly, from the cranial inquest because children as young as nine months and as old as 95 have choked on food um, or have aspirated food and liquids into their lungs that results in a pneumonia. If you, I'm going to um, pull out of this um, share screen mode in a moment and open it up for questions and comments and a, a bit of interaction. Um, but if you have whoops, questions um, or would like to join the mailing list and you're not currently on, um, then please email me at australia at iddsi.org. All right. And... So now if you'd like to unmute yourself um, or if you have trouble with that, let me know. There is a little chat box at the bottom. Um, but I'd like to open it up for questions and comments. Hi, Julie. It's Emily. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Beautiful. Sorry, I've got a few questions. I don't want to monopolise everybody's time. But I'm just um, at my workplace. I've kind of become the self-appointed uh, the champion. And so I'm looking to... Um, we've been developing an adoption strategy that we've based off um, what's on the ITSI site and kind of tailored it to our workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is that we're looking to run some in-house webinars um, 
early next year to you know, make sure everyone's familiar. So part of my question is whether I'm able to borrow some of your slides and things like as long as I um, obviously reference them and cite uh, yourself. So I'm just wondering, are they, is the, is the um, presentation today, is that available um, or will that be available that I can borrow some of those slides? I'm, I'm certainly happy to make that available. I think oh, that's, that there's no, yeah, no sense in reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Um, and you mentioned about the um, the dynamic swallow can't be used for paid purposes, but could I show that within um, the workplace? I'm just thinking like part of our strategy has been around just alerting management to the fact that we're going to need some syringes to support us to do mm -hmm. the flowchairs. And I thought actually if, if you know, to make sure I would see that kind of really reinforces why yeah. the flowchairs. For sure, and when I'm when I'm talking about payment as well, if you're you know using that to, uh, for education for you know for a client or care or, or, or whatever, and I recognise there's obviously going to be a fee involved in that. I'm not. It's not so much that. It's probably more. I know that there are some groups that do professional um, training modules and and you know credentialing and accreditation and or you know run courses and those sorts of things. It's more that kind of thing that we're sort of yeah. saying. Look, that's not what it's intended for. Yep. Okay, um, I've got a couple more. The, um, just in terms of the dual labelling, so something that we've done uh, recently is uh, revised our um, tools and templates to include um, dual labelling. So our meal time management plan now we've got um, the empty labels in there so that people can you know, add and delete as appropriate. So for the meal time management plans, and we've got both in there. And in, in our adoption strategy, we're looking at making sure that between now and uh, May that we use both labels. Great. What is your thoughts on how May? How long should we continue to use both labels? Look, I think I think if um, if they if you've had an opportunity to do the dual labelling, that really if you're comfortable from May and, and perhaps even in the the week or two weeks prior, just let yeah. them know we're getting ready to move. You know, to just. Yes to idsy labelling you can do that um i heard uh, recently at a um a hospital in um michigan that they did their entire education over a couple of months they announced that they were doing a changeover on the 6th of november that it would happen on the 7th of november and on the 7th of november everything switched yeah right okay. <laughs> so, I, I think education <laughs> is yeah, the key well prepared in that case. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the last question I have, sorry, I'm monopolising everybody's mm -hmm. time, but in terms of um, just for ease and making sure that things don't get lost, because in the past we've kind of tended to have uh, a meal time management plan and then you might also attach to an email so, um, you know, some information about foods to avoid or those sorts of things. And um, we've got some software called PDF Creator, which I'm finding fantastic to complete someone's meal time management plan and then as an appendix save that person's pages out of the framework. So whether if they're on level five yep. or, you know, and is that okay to do? So it's yeah. really straight from the um, straight from the framework and it's got the the you know piece on the bottom. And it's kind of a it comes as an addendum to the plan, but it just means that when you're emailing it out Yep. One document, and that's okay to do as well. Absolutely. So, perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, we've licensed it under Creative Commons for that purpose. If you can include the um, the EDSI website as well, so that if people have ever got a, a query or if things have changed, they can um, go back to that. But that's where I'm also hoping that you'll find the um, the patient handouts. Um, helpful and, and, and yeah I'm with you. I've, I've just been recently using PDF creative as well and loving it so yeah. great okay. yep. thank you yep pleasure I'll, I'll mute myself now <laughs> you're right thank you have we got any other questions or comments Was the information, um, I guess, helpful? I'm not sure whether you know some, perhaps some of the stuff from the um, the New South Wales Ombudsman's report was something that um, you've had available or, or been familiar with. Hi, Julie. It's Emily again. Yeah, it was it was helpful, and I, as far as I'm aware, um, the Disability Reform Council um, is meeting again today to look again at you know at that kind of the jurisdiction between health and disability services. So there may be some information in the wind in terms of you know our role as disability providers that we can 
um, you know, offer within somebody when they are to so that's still coming up. But I think the information around, you know, the risks and knowing uh, just a high percentage of choking incidents and reviewable dead is, you know, it's really helpful information when we're trying to educate people to say this is really important. Great. Um, yeah. So thank you. Pleasure.